there was no plan. There was no vision. Nobody saw those things coming. It was because they explored customer experiences. Top leaders, meaningful conversation, actionable advice, bulldoze complacency, ignite inspiration, create impact. Produced by Southwestern family of companies. This is the Action Catalyst. On today's episode, host Dan Moore speaks with John Rossman, a business strategist and expert on digital transformation, leadership, and business reinvention. He is a former Amazon executive responsible for launching and scaling Amazon Marketplace, which today is responsible for over 55% of all Amazon orders. John also ran Amazon Enterprise Services, with responsibilities for Toys R Us and Target.com. He also served as the Interim Chief Technology Officer for the Gates Foundation, and as the Senior Innovation Advisor to T-Mobile. As an author, his books, including The Amazon Way, focus on the strategies he learned during his time at the tech giant, and how they can be applied to businesses of any size. We hope you enjoy. What are we talking about today? Your whole life history in 30 minutes or less. That won't be interesting for anybody. So, <laughs> Really great to meet you today. Dan, thanks for welcoming me. I really appreciate all the work you do. Well, I feel like I already know you since about half our household budget goes to Amazon Marketplace, <laughs> which of course you were the executive responsible for launching and scaling that. Yeah. Some people see that as a real feature. Some people see that as a bug. So yes. <laughs> I'm so interested sort of in, in your story. I know you started off at, at Jesuit High School. I'm a real fan of of the Jesuit education. The real quality that I got out of that was they just had high expectations for me, right? And I had never been in an environment where people had high expectations for me. In in general, like I would say the environment I had come from, people kind of had low expectations. And so, wow, you know, start thinking about making a bigger impact. I went to Oregon State, was lucky to get a degree in industrial engineering, joined a consulting firm. But I think one of the big pivot points was joining the Amazon. So I joined Amazon in early 2002. I was there for about four years. I launched the marketplace business, which is third party selling at amazon.com. And what I learned from there just completely reformed me as a problem solver, as a communicator, as a leader that helps companies and leaders reimagine, you know, what their business should be in the digital era. And then, you know, writing the books that I've written, uh, the Amazon way being the one that we've done three editions of, you know, that combination of taking the learnings from Amazon and sharing them with others. That's really become, you know, my mission, which is helping companies win and compete in the digital era. And I use Amazon and a bunch of other reference points to give people not monumental shifts that they have to do, but little nudges, little things that we can do to help us take advantage of the situation we're in and to learn like what it means to compete in the digital era. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that can be a bit daunting is when we have a company that is not the size of Amazon to think how in the world can I ever get some lessons from a company that large and that successful? Well, what would you say to say a small business owner would be one real key finding for somebody that is in a very competitive marketplace and trying to figure figure their way out? I'm going to answer that bigger than just one thing. So first of all, you know, what everybody remembers is kind of about Amazon is like, you know, where they are today, the last 10 years where it's just been exponential growth and the stock has reflected that and everything. Amazon wasn't always this size, right? And uh, there was about a 10-year period where stock was flat, a lot of doubters and naysayers relative to their business model, and they earned everything that they got. These principles came from that era. And so these are not big company principles. These can be applied a lot of them as an individual, as a team, as an enterprise, and it has nothing to do with either the industry you're in or the size of, of the team. But you know, there's there's now 16 leadership principles at, at Amazon. The first is probably the most famous. It's about customer obsession and it reads, leaders start with the customer and work backwards. They work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. And while they pay attention to competitors, they obsess about customers. Now, You can't have just customer obsession, but leading with customer insights, being curious about your customer bigger and broader than just 
maybe how you intersect with them today, how you serve them today, your products, your services, really sets up so many great things uh, for a business and for a team. And so if there's one thing, if, I, if I'm forced to deliver one thing from Amazon, the one thing would be be extremely curious about your customers, the jobs they're doing, the frustrations they have, like what happens on a bad day? You know, everybody t- tends to, when you're in business, you kind of focus on like, well, how things work in general, right? No, 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 no. Be curious about what happens when things don't work uh, in general, when they don't work and be a problem solver, be a builder to build better approaches for for helping your customers in those moments. And, and that's the essence of everything from Amazon is start with the customer and work backwards. Mm-hmm. Which any size business or organization that's involved with people can do. Exactly. Because if we can get into their bad days, we can figure out ways to make those days not so bad. And that's when they want to work with us for a long period of time. Yeah. And, and again, it's, think about a broad customer experience, not just how your product or service is, is being used. You want to understand that intently, but understand upstream and downstream too it will give you better insight into your product and service, and you'll probably gain ideas of how to serve them bigger and broader than just what you do. And that's really been, you know, if you think about when I was at Amazon, 90% of the business was books, music, video, right? Think about where Amazon is today, the conglomerate business that Amazon is today. And it was really that mindset of exploring different types of customers and the broad customer experience, not just how you're working with them today. That's really been the the catalyst that has taken them onto a journey that there was no plan. There was no vision. Nobody predicted that Amazon would be the world's biggest cloud technology company in the world. Nobody predicted that Amazon would be the most dynamic and innovative logistics company in the world. Like nobody saw those things coming. It was because they explored customer experiences. That customer obsession doesn't have a timestamp on it. No, no. I think that patience element, understanding what to be patient for and what to be impatient for is a, is a real business superpower for leaders. And Amazon, I think one of their real superpowers is the ability to be patient in the right way on certain investments. Bezos has been quoted several times of saying, just because on some investments, he can be patient for seven to eight years before payback versus his competitors, which have 18 to 36 months, it allows him to compete completely differently. He can do things that his competitors can't follow. So that patience can be a real, if, if you think long-term, can be a real defining feature of how you create legacy and how you compete in enduring business that competes for the long term. John, even though your career is full of stars on it, I know that you've hit some brick walls along the way. What kind of strategies would you share with us regarding when some unexpected, completely out of the blue obstacle just derails everything, knocks you flat on your butt? Well, understand what's within your control. You know, the 14th leadership principle at Amazon is deliver results. And what it talks about is that leaders deliver hard results despite setbacks, despite dependencies, and that we focus on the the controllable inputs more than we focus on the uncontrollable outputs. And so in life, in business, especially if you're doing hard, unpredictable, innovative things, you, you need to have a plan, but things never go to plan, right? You better love setbacks, especially if you're going to be an innovator and a game changer. Just always be thinking about what's your next best available step, right? Understand your controllable inputs versus, you know, kind of the outputs you want, the goals that you have, but realizing You know, there's a lot of factors that go on outside of your control relative to achieving those goals. Just understand your next best available step. Yeah, I'm glad you blew that up for us because when you look at the words deliver results, it seems to be outcome based. But what you're saying is if we look at what we control, which are all the inputs, ultimately the outcomes are going to happen the way we want them to, provided we're doing the inputs correctly and with the right focus. And you do want those to have those outputs, as you talked about. In fact, one of the leadership principles is about thinking big and then encourages leaders to create inspiring visions for you know what a product, what a service, what a business could be. But that's why you need the complement of 
Yes, but break it down to the small controllable steps that you're going to take this year, this quarter, this month, this week, today in order to get there. And that's how you build towards those things. And sometimes the outputs come or the outcomes come in a different flavor. Sometimes they take longer. Sometimes you get outcomes that you never intended or saw, but that balancing factor of thinking long-term, thinking big, but bringing it back to like a manageable time frame and what are we in control of? What can we do next? That's that's where, you know, action matters and, and you know, where you're in full control. I like that. You know, I think that vision is kind of the fuel in the tank and what we do with our hands on the steering wheel and the shifter and the turn signals are the controllables that really cut that fuel to get someplace we want it to go. Yeah. There, there's a good business planning tool, goal setting tool that's that's pretty popular these days that is in line with this notion we're talking about. It's called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. And it's essentially says you set your goals, your objectives, which could be a year long or two year long objectives, but then you create key results that are probably no more than 90 days, right? And well, those, these are the key things we're going to get done over the next 30 to 90 days that we believe will lead to this objective. And so it just helps create this kind of zoom out, zoom in, you know, kind of mindset that we're talking about. When I started out in sales at the age of 18, they said, you want to have a great summer. You want to do really well. But the main thing you'd focus on is the next two hours. Yeah. I've got two boys that have just graduated college and you know, one of them asked me like, what's one thing you do that you, you think you think I should do? And I said, on Sunday nights, I sit down and I write my to-do list for the week. You know, that's that's the time frame that helps me out is thinking about the big things I need to get done this week. And I actually think forward to the next week because so many of my things are like setting up meetings and you typically need two weeks to kind of get a meeting set up and everything. And that, that you know, kind of to-do list orientation is, you know, a real healthy little habit. Right. Would you say that's one of the ways that you keep yourself in a strong, motivated mode instead of just going into the coasting mode and sitting back and enjoying all the accolades? I love problem solving. Like I love helping a team see a path where today they don't see a path. That's, that's ultimately, it's, it's kind of my superpower. It's what I really enjoy doing. And and seeing a team achieve success and see potential where where they were kind of stuck before, that's what really is the fuel in my tank. These are just kind of some of the tools that help keep me prioritized relative to to achieving that. And I love sharing it. I love writing the books that I do. And that helps me think better and helps pass it on. So problem solving is is a really cool thing to talk about for just a second because you have the ability to take a perspective that maybe a person too close to it can't really see. What other kind of insights would you put to people that are faced with problems in general? I guess what's a mindset you would adopt toward what people would say is a problem instead of throwing the hands up in the air? Well, there's lots of little tricks, right? Problem reframing can be a really powerful tool. And, and reframing but just basically says like restate the situation, your problem in different terms. And that can help you see things from a different perspective. I think, again, understanding kind of like what you're in control of versus what you're not in control of is a helpful thing relative to problem solving. And so many times, especially in business, one aspect that doesn't get explored enough is incentives, creating the right incentive systems, especially when you get, need to get people you know, in your ecosystem, moving to help accomplish something, thinking through incentive systems is a is a real interesting way of exploring like how oh, a different way of creating action, right? And so that's where like systems dynamic is a powerful framework and study to use because it helps show the forces between different organizations, capabilities, factors that are in play. And so you start to see the relativity and how these things work together and you'll spot opportunities. Amazon has a famous version of kind of their system dynamic. It's the Amazon flywheel. And it it basically was a simple articulation of their business strategy. And so it allowed us to state our business strategy, both to our team and to the market, to the investors, and so that everybody could get it. It was a simple but not simplistic point of view of communicating what we were trying to get done 
uh, by adding selection, by adding sellers to create growth, which created a great customer experience, which spun the flywheel. That's a system dynamic mindset at work. And some of those tools for some of the more complex and dynamic situations can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And flywheels are all based on momentum, keeping that momentum strong. And partly it's like, what's the most leveraged position where we insert energy that could be resources, time, effort, energy to help create that moment. Because oftentimes like, oh, we, we don't, we're not getting that momentum or we need to create that momentum or accelerate that momentum. And by having an understanding of that flywheel, then you understand, well, that's my point of leverage. If I put a little bit of pressure there, the theory is, the, the hypothesis is, is that that will create momentum that we get to take advantage of. You spoke about it, incentive systems. John, what about incentives that don't involve cash? There's all sorts of incentive systems that don't involve cash. And, you know, so when I think about like the Amazon marketplace business, we had to think through incentives of, well, how other than just sales, how do we create incentives that help our sellers do the right thing on behalf of our customers, which was a key part of the flywheel. So we we developed a set of tools and a set of measures, KPIs, key performance indicators, metrics that gave the sellers in a very scalable way, meaning we didn't have to put a lot of ongoing effort to it. We built tools and technologies that helped them do the right thing and then some incentives to motivate them to do that. For example, if they started slipping on in-stock percentages or on-time delivery percentages, guess what? Their search results started to, to drop. dwindle down a little bit, you know, and everything. So you you could say, well, that's a cash incentive. It's kind of an indirect cash uh, incentive, but it's not a direct penalty. It's a subtle, like you do the right thing. We're going to help you out a little bit more. You don't treat our customers well. We're going to penalize you a little bit. So that's an example of using the right kind of leverage, all focused on what's best for the customer, that obsession with the customer experience. Right. You know, a lot of our listeners are in pretty good pathways in their lives right now. Things are, are joyful and they're feeling good about things. Got some others that are kind of discouraged and they're kind of down. What advice would you give to somebody that has just hit a point where they don't know where to turn, they don't know what to do next? I guess seeking words of encouragement. You know, I'd say, you know, learn something that you can put to work today, right? And that could be in your job, could be in your life. That would be one thing. And then when you feel good physically, it tends to to help you just be more optimistic. Like I believe in the power of exercise, not just because of the physical benefit, but because of the, the positive mental benefits out of it. And so if you're not feeling great, go get a good workout in. It not only gets the endorphins moving and the bloodstream in the right direction, but also it's a feeling of pride and satisfaction that we did something that maybe at the moment we didn't feel like doing. That's right. You get something done. Kind of a reminder that if we can get one thing done, we can maybe get another thing done. It just breaks that log jam of not going in any direction at all. And just the habit of kind of taking the next best available action, right? Like that back to something we've already talked about, which is like, you know, when something's got you down, a little perplexed, just be leaning forward and asking, well, what's the next best available step? That's a good one because often the next step is not going to look like the best one, but it's the only one available. And if it is, we're going to take it. Otherwise, we're going to assess and take a better one. Well, we opened up by you sharing that your early schooling helped you understand the importance of high standards, people with high expectations that you had not experienced that before on a more of a societal level. Is there something we can apply from that to our nation to help people be the, the shining city on the hill that was once envisioned? I think the ability to have open discourse, respectful discourse, and welcome contrary views in sincere ways that is the basis for so much that can be accomplished nationally, internationally. Whenever you can understand others better, I think that you learn and you figure out where you can make progress. So one of the leadership principles talks about this. Learn and be curious is the leadership principle. Leaders are never done learning and always seek to improve themselves. They are curious about new possibilities and act to explore them. They seek diverse perspectives and work to disconfirm their beliefs. And what we tend to do is just live in a echo chamber, right? Like people telling us what we already believe in. 
And I think in both business as well as societal, that that's, that's a danger when all you're hearing is the stuff that you absolutely believe in, that you need to be open towards discourse and hearing things that you may not necessarily believe in. And that's what real communication is about. And avoiding those subtle forms of confirmational bias. That's right. That, I mean, that is what confirmation bias is. It's just listening to stuff that tells you what you already believe. Right. Well, John, thank you. Time with you goes really, really fast. I appreciate your insights, appreciate the, the life that you lead and the good things that you've done for our world and know that you will continue to. Thank you. And back at you. Thanks for everything that your show does and the conversations too. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. And to stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and on Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. And thanks for listening.